In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless, a void. There was darkness on the face of the deep, and God's spirit was hovering back and forth on the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light. How good. And God separated between the light and the darkness. John's Gospel begins similarly. In the beginning was God's wisdom, and the wisdom was with God, and God was the wisdom. This one was in the beginning with God. All things through him came to be, and without him not one thing came to be. That which has come into being was life, and the life was the light of human being. And the light in the darkness shines, and the darkness did not grasp it. In Genesis, light came to be in the midst of primordial darkness. But John suggests suggests a struggle between two forces— in which light prevails. It is in the darkness of night that Nicodemus approaches Jesus. Knowledgeable in Jewish law and teachings and devoted to maintaining obedience to God, Nicodemus recognizes similar gifts in Jesus. He approaches Jesus with what his human senses perceive, acknowledging Jesus as a good teacher of Torah, but that he also does signs, signs that can only be done with God's life-giving presence. In response, Jesus tells Nicodemus that unless someone is born anew, they are unable to see the kingdom of God. And unless someone is born of water and spirit, they are unable to enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is confused, and he finds it impossible for these things to happen. How is it an old man could be born or enter a mother's womb for a second time? But Jesus is challenging Nicodemus to a deeper understanding of God's work in the world. Consider Abraham. We heard in the first reading God's call and promise to Abraham. God promised a great nation and that all the families of the earth shall be blessed by Abraham. But in their old age, Abraham and Sarah still had no children. God promised that in due season, Sarah would bear a son. Upon hearing this, Abraham and Sarah laughed. Consider Moses. While leading his flock in the wilderness, God spoke to Moses in a burning bush and commissioned him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses questioned, me? I don't even know your name. Why would they listen to me or believe me? I don't even speak eloquently. Or Jesus' disciples. Jesus and his disciples were amid a great crowd. Filled with compassion, Jesus urged his disciples to feed the crowd. The disciples panicked. They protested. Neither did they have enough money nor enough food to feed so many people, only five loaves and two fish. Consider Paul. He was threatening and murdering Christians when light from heaven flashed around him. Jesus appeared and urged him to get up and enter Damascus. Again, 
God is making possible what seems to be impossible. Nicodemus has observed that Jesus is a skilled and thoughtful teacher, knowing the law and teachings of Torah, but there's something that is mystifying, something that has left Nicodemus perplexed. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. But Nicodemus's thinking is of flesh. He's playing mental gymnastics with the earthly things. We can almost hear echoes of Abraham and Sarah's laughter. Moses's questions, the disciples' protests, and the arrested silence of Paul's companions. Because this is a repeated pattern for God's people. Jesus says, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Give to those in need. We laugh. Huh, you've got to be kidding me. Jesus says, if you, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. We question, deny myself, but where am I to live? How will I sustain my family? Jesus says, be reconciled to your brother or sister. We protest but they need to apologize first. I don't even know them. They're just a stranger on the internet. And yet, Sarah bore a son. Moses liberated the Israelites. The multitudes were fed. Scales fell from Paul's eyes and he began preaching. Paul tells us in today's epistle reading that the Abraham story is not about what Abraham does, but about what God does. God's story is bigger than Abraham could imagine, or Sarah, or Moses, or Jesus' disciples, even Paul himself, or Nicodemus, or you, or me. God gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. We're called into God's expansive story. Nicodemus fades out of our immediate narrative. His conversion doesn't happen with a flash of light or scales falling from his eyes. But we do learn later in in John's Gospel that Nicodemus protested when his colleagues proposed condemning Jesus without a hearing. And Nicodemus presents large quantities of burial spices and with Joseph of Arimathea prepared Jesus' body for burial. Nicodemus began to turn little by little The text we're using for our our adult forum class makes a comparison of God to music that doesn't resolve. Quote, God remains throughout our lives a question rather than an answer, some say mystery. As we pursue the mystery, however, our questions about God do resolve into more embraceable questions, questions about ourselves, end quote. I think this was true for Nicodemus. God's work in the world is beyond our imagination. We laugh, question, protest, and try to make sense of it. But we need not know where the wind comes or where it goes. The power of the Spirit blows where it chooses. Are we listening for it? God continues to speak. May we turn little by little. Lent is a time to listen. By denying ourselves and embracing the gift of God's abundant love, we enter into mystery. But we're promised a new life 
in the depths of our being because light prevails. Amen.